So tonight I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. George Hamilton, who's chair of the Department of Entomology and also director of the graduate program in entomology. He has degrees in environmental biology and entomology, and he's been a member of the Rutgers faculty since 1987, uh, as well as now he's the chair of that department of entomology. His research interests include biological control, the development of IPM tactics, and he's gonna to have to tell us what that is, to manage pests and invasive insect pests, such as the brown marmorated stink bug and tonight's star of the show, the spotted lantern fly. And in honor of that, I killed one about an hour ago. So uh, we're all um, here for a good reason, I know that. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Hamilton of the Rutgers Department of Entomology, who's going to tell us all about the spotted lantern fly. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. And make sure that you can see my screen and then I'm going to minimize you. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Um, I am going to talk about the spotted lantern fly. I'm going to talk a bit, little bit about its spread here in New Jersey, uh, give you an update on where it currently is found. I'll talk a little bit about the quarantine zone expansion that just happened two weeks ago. And I'll talk a little bit about the management of this insect and the things that you can do uh, to try and help the situation. Unfortunately, I don't think any of us are going to be able to solve the problem, but at least we can help. And so this is a picture in the upper right of the adult spotted lantern fly, just in case you haven't seen it before. It's very colorful with spotted front wings and hind wings that are also red. Um, it has yellow on, on its body. And again, it's very colorful. A lot of people initially when they first see this actually think it's a moth, but it is a leaf hopper uh, in the family Fulgoridae. And it is an invasive plant hopper from Northern China. And so that term invasive, I just wanna define that for people. Uh, most people think that it, Basically, anything that's introduced into the United States from someplace else is invasive. Um, no, it's a foreign invader, but it's not invasive unless it causes some kind of economic or environmental damage in the area that it has been, been introduced to. Um, this invasive um, is, again, from northern China. And in Asia, it is invasive in South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, Japan, and now the United States. And so it is causing issues over in Asia as well. Um, it has a preference for feeding on plants with high sugar content. And so it's very much like an aphid and that will play into the story here that I'm gonna try and tell tonight. Um, many of you may be already aware of this if you have this in your backyard. And just to give you an idea of the group itself, the uh, picture in the lower left-hand corner, that is another plant hopper um, in the family Fogoridae. That is a US species. Um, it is also very colorful, but it's considerably smaller than the spotted lanternfly. Um, this is, is the biggest plant hopper that I'm aware of here in the United States now. And then in the lower right hand corner, I have a, another picture of an Asian uh, fulgoid um, plant hopper. And again, you can see it's brightly colored and it actually has a very ornate um, head structure on it. Uh, this is the in initial um, place where it was introduced into the country in 2014. Uh, into Berks County, Pennsylvania. It's thought that it came into the country as egg masses, which is the overwintering stage of this insect, in a shipment of uh, stone that came to Berks County um, from China. Those egg masses hatched. Um, the owners of the property realized that this wasn't something that 
they had seen before. And they either called the extension office in the county or they called the, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. I'm not quite sure which, uh, but that, that started the ball rolling. And so Pennsylvania has been dealing with this since 2014. Uh, this gives you an idea of where it is in Pennsylvania. And so all of the counties in purple are counties that are now currently under quarantine. And that does have some implications and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but you can see it has spread quite a bit further than just Berks County. And the blue ones are counties that have just actually been added this year. So in New Jersey, this was first um, found in Warren County in 2018. It actually came into the state on a Christmas tree that was bought at a cut your own facility over in Pennsylvania. Uh, the people set the tree up in their living room and the, it was warm and the egg masses hatched and all of a sudden they had these little new ornaments running around their tree. And so they called people and the Department of Ag came, um, they took away the tree disposed of the um, insects and then did surveys in the area the following spring just to make sure that there wasn't anything there. Unfortunately, by um, 2019, it had spread, um, including Mercer County. Um, and so our first quarantine area were, was between uh, Mercer, Hunterdon and Warren County. Uh, when they did this, they had not found anything in Hunterdon County, uh, but they decided to quarantine it uh, because it was right in the middle and they figured it would get there very quickly and it did. It got there in 2019. Um, they then expanded that uh, quarantine area to Somerset, Burlington, Camden, and Salem. And so we had seven counties in quarantine. Now what does the quarantine mean? Well, it means that if you are in that quarantine area and you are going to leave that quarantine area, you're going to drive to a location where they do not have spotted lantern fly or not in uh, quarantine. You are required by the Department of Agriculture to check your vehicles um, to, just to make sure that you don't have any spotted lantern fly on the vehicle or on any material, say it was a pickup truck that might be in the bed of the truck. And there, there are some forms that you're supposed to fill out that you can get from the Department of Agriculture uh, website. And I'll give you that website here in a few minutes. Um, it's a voluntary program. Um, I don't believe that they do much in the way of, of inspecting um, private citizens, but they um, are a little more strict with the commercial people because they have a different policy and, and steps that they have to go through. And they have to keep paperwork in their vehicle that they have actually done this and it's signed off by a representative of the company. And so this is really important because at least initially, this is really the only way that we have to, to stop um, the insect from moving into other areas of the state. Sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not. Uh, with Asian longhorn beetle, it was very effective. With emerald ash borer, it was not very effective. And the biology of the insect actually has a lot to do with that in terms of how quickly they can spread out into new areas. So in, very early on in 2018, we started a reporting site to help the Department of Agriculture find this insect. And so this is are just maps of the reports that we received in 2018, 19, and 20. And you can see a progression here as it increases in number. You're actually seeing the, the spread here of this insect um, throughout New Jersey. And this, these reports also tell us something about the activity because we don't get many um, reports in the winter time, but um, this time of year up until the middle of October, 
we were getting lots and lots of reports and you can see the uh, increase in the number of reports here uh, by year over that three year period. And so, as I said, in 2018, they uh, established a three county quarantine. 2019, and they added seven additional, um, four additional counties, excuse me. And then this year, again, just a week or so ago, they added an additional seven counties to the quarantine here in New Jersey. And again, that, that's another indication that this insect is spreading. Um, the website that I, I mentioned is badbug.nj.gov. If you go to that uh, website, you can find, out, find lots of information about this insect and things you can do and information about the quarantine and what the, that means in terms of the steps if you're a commercial person or a private citizen. Um, we also have a website at the university um, it, it, um, it's njaes.ruckers.edu slash spotted lanternfly, catchy name. And we have information there as well. And we have lots of links to um, the information that's um, with the Department of Agriculture and also the information that is coming out of Penn State. Um, they are the front runner in research with this insect, obviously, because they've had it longer. And uh, we, we have kind of been hindered at the college um, because we were not in a quarantine zone, which means that we're not actually allowed to bring this insect into our laboratories to do work on it um, for fear that we might actually start a new infestation where it wasn't. But now, as of a week and a half ago, I can bring spotted lantern fly into my lab and we can do all kinds of things with it now. So here is the current quarantine area. Um, the blue counties um, with the stars are the new additions. The rest of the blue is where has it been confirmed here in the state. And it's everywhere but Cape May County. And I've been getting a lot of questions. Why not Cape May County? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It may be just that the habitat is different enough in Cape May County that it's not a good place for them to survive. May not have the proper hosts that they need um, to survive on because they do a lot of host switching. Uh, throughout the year, the different instars actually leave their host and go to another host and come back. And I've actually been following this this year and it's, it's quite interesting. They do a lot of moving around. In terms of the East Coast, this is a map. Um, this just came out today, so it is up to date. And so, just a second, okay, good. Um, as you can see, it's not just Pennsylvania and New Jersey anymore. Um, there are established um, populations in New York, in Connecticut. Um, it's out on Long Island. It's in every one of the New York City boroughs, including um, Central Park. It's been found in Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, um, West Virginia, um, Ohio. And now there's two counties in Ohio um, that have this insect, uh, most likely from hitchhiking, because again, they're very good hitchhikers. And then another new one this summer um, is in Indiana. If you see there in the, in the southeastern corner. Um, they have one county now where that where it is uh, it occurs. And so that's also got to be another um, hitchhiking event, uh, not through normal spread. Okay, um, so this is just a map of a model that's been modeling that's been done to predict predict where the suitable areas are for this insect. Um, this is a good start to give us an idea of where it might um, occur. And so the modeling tells us, of course, uh, where we see it in the mid-Atlantic. And it does show that it, it can survive in the Midwestern states there in the red areas, um, and also in the Central Valley and some of the, the coastal areas um, in California. And so these are the areas that we would have concern about this insect. 
Uh, from an agricultural standpoint, um, all of these areas do have wineries and they do grow wine grapes. And so that's our biggest concern currently um, with this insect it is the, the damage it could potentially cause to wine grapes uh, growing in these areas. Now we have to take this map with a grain of salt. Uh, when I was working with um, brown marmorated stink bug, they did the same thing. And that map predicted that it wouldn't occur in um, Florida at all. It wouldn't be able to survive the summer temperatures. Well, unfortunately um, it has, and it is now a pest of peaches in Florida. And so, you know, this is just an idea where it could have an impact and, or, and survive it at high levels, but it's, it's nowhere near probably the final answer on this. And so this will change. Okay, so here's another picture of, of the insect. And again, as you probably are aware, it is quite large. It's an inch to an inch and a half long. And when it jumps, it jumps long distances. And as people try to kill it, that's a problem. They have to be quick or it'll jump away. Or as you walk along, and this happens in the gardens at Rutgers where I'm doing some of my research, um, you walk along the pathways and they're in the foliage and you don't see them until they fly away, uh, like a lot of insects do. But again, this thing's very colorful and it's large. And so it's very easy to see when it does that. And so again, I'll just point out the coloration again. Um, we have the grayish wings with the black spots and we have the, the hind wings um, have red areas on them with the black spots. And so it, it's easy to, to identify. Talk a little bit now about the life cycle. Um, what you're seeing here in the picture um, is an egg mass. Initially, um, they are light colored and then they turn this grayish color. They um, secrete this um, protective coating over the egg masses to help them survive the winter. This is when it's hatched. You can see the little holes that are in the, in the lines going um, vertically up that egg mass. And so this is what it'll look like after they hatch next spring. Um, the adults can lay eggs anytime from August to November. They are out there in some places laying eggs now. They actually started a little early this year. And that's because they became adults a little early this year, earlier than, than normal. And we think the, the high temperatures this um, summer had something to do with that since they're cold blooded. And so the, the warmer it is, the faster they go through their different life stages. Um, the females will lay eggs on most surfaces. Um, if it's flat, they can potentially lay an egg on it. And so they can lay eggs on children's um, yard equipment and all sorts of different things. Um, there's usually 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. And again, as I said earlier, this is the overwintering stage. Um, the eggs hatch in the spring in um, May and early June, and they have pretty good hatch rates, um, the 60 to 90% hatch rates. And that contributes to the, how fast they can um, increase in population. They have four nymphal instars, and so they have four juvenile stages. Um, you see a picture, two pictures here of the early instars. They're black with um, white spots on them. Um, as they go through the different stages and get to the, the fourth juvenile stage, they actually turn red and then they have black and white spots on them. Um, they are very mobile, as I have, have said, and they can move long distances quite quickly. Um, they have looked at this in the, in the laboratory and in the field to see how well they move around. And if you look at that bottom picture, um, there's a wire that's been glued to that, probably third instar. That is a radar tent antenna of sorts, and they have a way of 
following the insects and monitoring how where they're going and how fast they're going with this harmonic radar system. And so they've determined that the nymphs can move about three and a quarter feet per minute and that they can climb about 16 feet in uh, 15 minutes. And so they do move around quite a lot. Tree of Heaven has a, a big um, role in terms of the life history of this insect. And that's a picture of the fronds of, of the tree, the leaves of the tree in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Um, all in stars feed on it. And it appears that the adults need to feed on it to mature. We're not quite sure why. We do know that, we, that it does, um, sequester some of the nasty chemicals that are in tree of heaven to keep a lot of things from feeding on it. And we think that they're using that as defense for themselves to keep things from eating it. The good news is, is it only has one generation per year. If this had two or more generations per year, we would probably see much higher populations already in terms of, of what we see today. And so this is just a rehash diagram of, of the life cycle with them laying their eggs late in the fall. Um, those eggs hatch from May to June. They enter the second juvenile stage or the second instar in June and July, third in June and July, and then the fourth um, in July through September. Although I haven't seen any of the fourth instars um, since the beginning of September. And then July to December, the the adults are out and from September to December, they're out there laying eggs. Um, they disappear late in the fall when the temperatures either get too cold or we have a series of really good frosts and that will kill them off. But until that happens, um, potentially the females can be out there laying eggs. So there's no obligate diapause for this insect in terms of their egg masses. Diapause is just a fancy way that entomologists talk about insects hibernating. Um, there is a critical threshold for egg hatch and um, development, and it's eight degrees centigrade. Um, what that means is they have to get that cold in, in order to have good egg hatch. And then they will, can't um, hatch in the springtime until they accumulate 550 degree days. That's just a, a fancy way of predicting development based on maximum and minimum temperatures throughout a period of time that we calculate on a daily basis and we add them up. And when they hit 550 of those degree days, they can actually um, start hatching. And so we um, use this kind of information to predict when um, certain um, events in our life are going to happen. And so we're working, um, my lab at Rutgers is working with a lab up in Connecticut um, at Ansonia with the US Forest Service, um, working on doing all the temperature work so that we can accurately predict and model um, their development using degree day models. Uh, we're doing it up there because they have a, a quarantine facility which is designed for handling uh, foreign insects without them getting getting out. And I've had a graduate student that spent the last two summers sequestered up there at, at their laboratory doing this work. Um, in terms of distribution, uh, in trees at least, uh, small trees, the, the number of egg masses um, are below three meters in height usually. However, in much larger trees, they can be found up in the canopy as well. Um, woods that are adjacent to vineyards um, can be a problem because again, they have a strong association for laying egg masses on, on, in the vineyards and on the, the grapevines. Um, they also tend to like to lay their structure, their eggs um, on the undersides of limbs and so if you think about a vineyard, um, at the end of each row, they have these wood um, structures that they use that have horizontal posts that they use to keep the wires tensioned so that the grapes can grow on them and not sag. 
Um, they like to lay their egg masses on the undersides of those horizontal wood beams. And, and they will do the same thing in trees. They also like, um, they'll lay them on trees that have fallen over at, to about a 45 degree angle as well. So this is some of the hosts. This is not all of the hosts that they feed on. Um, they feed on, I think we're up to about 70 different um, hosts that they feed on. But you, what's important about this um, slide is you can see the diversity of things that they feed on. They feed on plants in several different plant families, uh, including things like sugar maple and red maple birch, dogwood, and black locust. Uh, this time of year, they're feeding on walnut. Um, they're also feeding on um, tree of heaven and um, a couple of other things. And again, um, the last one at the bottom on the right, um, that's the wild grapes. They also feed on Virginia creeper and they do very well on early in the season on um, poison ivy. Although this year, uh, the populations in the garden were high enough that I think they actually killed the poison ivy. There were so many of them feeding on them. So that may be a good thing. Um, probably not in, in the big picture of things. Um, preferred hosts are list, listed here. A tree of heaven, black walnut, grape, the two couple of the maples, river birch um, on willow. They will feed on conifers, but it's not a preferred host. Um, the people at Penn State have also worked out, uh, are there trees that they can completely um, develop on without feeding on other things? And yes, there is tree of heaven, black walnut, china berry, and a couple of other uh, plants. Um, they can, that's all they need. Um, however, they do better when they have a variety of uh, plant material to feed on. So in talking with groups, um, I'm, I'm never really sure um, if everybody knows what a tree of heaven looks like. And so this is an, a mature tree of heaven. Uh, most people are also not familiar with the fact that tree of heaven has male form trees and female form trees. And so the female trees do um, bloom in the spring. And I, we have a picture here in the upper right of the yellow flowers. And when pollinated, they um, actually um, turn into seed pods. And that's the, the seed pods just um, turning into seed pods. This time of year, they're probably uh, dark brown in, in color. And um, that's part of the way that this tree uh, reproduces. And we make use of the fact that there are male and female trees in, in one of the control strategies that's, that's been de developed. Um, also, this tree um, does, if you're familiar with it, do a lot of suckering. And so it runs um, roots under the ground that a distance away from the original tree, new saplings will emerge and start growing. And so that also uh, works into um, some of the control strategies that have been developed by the folks at Penn State. So just a little bit of plant taxonomy. I, I'm not a good person with plants. Ask me about an insect that I can tell you. Um, but it has uh, pinnately compound leaves. And at the base of the leaves, they have these tooth-like structures that I have circled here in, in black. And they have 10 to 40 leaflets. Uh, people do confuse this um, with sumac. Um, but you, if you look at the leaves and if you crush the leaves, they actually have a peanut butter odor uh, when you crush them. And you can use that as a way to, to tell it from uh, sumac. And as I've already said, um, it does um, contribute to um, settlement and proliferation of the insects. And the adults show a definite pre preference for tree of heaven. And, and as I think I've already said uh, right now, um, at the Rutgers Gardens, if I want to find them, I just go find Tree of Heaven and they are all over the Tree of Heaven. So a little bit about uh, control tactics, management track tactics. We, we have chemical and we have non-chemical options. 
Um, the first non-chemical option is to scrape the egg masses off, starting in October when they start to appear and then through May, um, depending uh, if you miss some in the fall. Um, credit card, hard card, just scrape them off, um, put them in a double bag and dispose of the bags. Or when you scrape them off, you can scrape them off into alcohol or hand sanitizer. Although uh, these days, hand sanitizer, well, I guess it's better now. Six months ago, giving this talk, I would have said that hand, hand sanitizer might be in short supply, so you might want to use alcohol. But that will kill them as well. Um, tree banding is something that has been discussed and is recommended. Uh, this is very similar to what we used to do back in the 70s and early 80s uh, for gypsy moth control. Uh, we did that because the, the caterpillars would move up and down the tree. And so this insect does it as well. And so we can take, make use of that. And so the idea here is you can wrap sticky bands around the tree. They get stuck on the bands. And then you remove the band and replace it with a new one. You have to do that um, because if you don't replace them, um, Penn State has shown that there's a certain density in terms of the numbers on the band that after that, the rest of them just climb over the ones that are stuck and they don't get stuck themselves. So you have to switch them out. There doesn't seem to be any color preference that I'm aware of. So a brown band, this one's yellow, they're out there in green. The one thing that we also ask people to do that if you want to do this, please uh, wrap um, chicken wire around the band. Uh, and this is to keep what things from getting stuck to it that we don't want to get stuck. Um, things like monarch butterflies and other butterflies and Penn State has shown that small lizards can get stuck in, in this material and other things. And we wanna to try to avoid that. The other option here um, are circle traps. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen one before, but this is what it looks like. Um, this is a very simple one um, that you can make yourself. And I've given you um, the websites where you can get the um, instructions for building your own and then a YouTube video about how to properly install these. Um, these are only going to work though on trees that have a certain diameter to them in terms of the size of the trunk. Um, it's, it's just the way that they're built. It, it's a netting thing that kind of funnels them up the tree into the collection devices. Um, I think these are both plastic Ziploc bags and then you can just remove the Ziploc bag and dispose of it and replace it with another. So this is another option and there hasn't been any uh, reports that I know of anything else getting into these. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't have the problems that the circle uh, traps or I'm sorry, the sticky bands have. The Department of Agriculture uh, has come up with a tree removal program uh, in Pennsylvania. Folks developed this. Um, our state Department of Agriculture has been doing some of this. They've been doing tree surveys, surveys up and down the Delaware River, uh, looking for tree heaven and looking for um, spotted lanternfly. Um, they are to a point now where this is very expensive to do to remove tree heaven. And so they're, they're targeting removal, I think, now for areas that are next to vineyards here in the state to try and reduce the populations. And so the program consists of killing tree heaven if it's on your property. And the idea here is to cut down and treat the stumps with a herbicide for 90% of the trees um, on the property. And you wanna make sure that you get all of the female trees if possible, because if you don't and they seed, it's just gonna put more seed into the soil um, and result in another generation of trees that you'll have to deal with. Um, the remaining 10% of the trees, we're leaving them as kind of a trap for the spotted lantern fly. 
And so this time of year, when they move to those trees, then we treat the trunk of the tree um, with dinotefuran, a 10% solution. Dinotefuran is a neonicotinoid um, insecticide and neonicotinoid um, insecticides do have issues. Um, but we're not treating the, flower, the bloom stage. We're not treating at the time when bloom occurs. Now, dinotefuran, as all of the neonicotinoid insecticides are, are systemic, which means it's taken in by the plant and moved to all the different portions of the plant. Um, if it's, I, we used to, to uh, recommend another option, imidacloprid, another um, neonicotinoid, um, but Penn State folks showed that that material actually will last in the tree until the following spring and appear in the, the flowers of the tree, which is not good if it's pollinated um, by insects uh, because that could impact them. And so we don't recommend that anymore. You might see that in recommendations, but we're suggesting that you don't do that and use the dinotefuran um, if you can find it. And it's probably only gonna be available to commercial uh, landscapers and to tree people um, to do this. And it goes in the tree, but it doesn't last in the tree uh, until the following spring and have the same problems as the dinotefuran. Or I'm sorry, as the middle culprit. Dr. Hamilton, we have yes. a bunch of questions. Can okay. Take some right now. Absolutely. Some of them you have covered, so maybe I'll try to reframe them a little bit in case there might have been something missed. So you had talked okay. about how to spot the egg masses. You had said something about they can get on like a playground furniture, or there's something that is a really good telltale sign of knowing what this is when you see it. Is there any? It look, kind of okay, so I can tell you what the problem is with finding it. Um, it looks like it's, it's a patch of mud on things. Um, you have to look very closely. And so we get a lot of um, pictures emailed to us and, and so forth. Um, a lot of people are thinking um, lichen is um, spotted lantern fly um, egg masses. Um, they are that color when they're first laid, but they get much darker and browner and eventually grayish in color as they age. And so that, that process of finding them and killing the eggs is, is going to help, but um, you're not gonna find all of them on the tree um, unless you can have the ability to climb to the top of the tree and check everything, but it will help. Okay. Um, since the insect was also in China, is it invasive in China or have they identified a method to control the spread there? Good question. Um, and I, if we have, had have time, I'll talk more about that. Um, so the reason it's not a problem in China is it has natural enemies there that feed on it, um, especially the um, egg masses. There are very tiny uh, wasps where the females lay their eggs in the eggs of the spotted lantern fly. Their eggs hatch and then they eat the egg contents and no spotted lantern fly comes out of that egg mass. Um, they don't have those in um, Korea and um, Taiwan and Vietnam and the other countries in Japan that I mentioned. And so that's why they're a problem there. And that's why they're a problem here because when things like this get introduced, they don't always come, in fact, they almost never come with the natural enemies that keep them in check where in their origin. And so, our Department of Agriculture, and in fact, there's a USDA lab down in Newark, Delaware, that has gone to China and they have identified um, some of these little tiny wasps, a couple of different species. They have brought them back to Delaware and they have a quarantine lab. And so they are in the process of going through the steps necessary to get permission from APHIS which is the Animal Plant Health Inspection System with USDA. Uh, they're the folks that check people coming in for food and plant material and whatnot at the airports uh, 
when you see the, the little dog running around, it's not a drug dog, it's looking for plant material. Um, so their hope if they can get permission from APHIS is that they will be able to release that tiny little wasp or wasp, depending on if they get more than one approved, and that eventually it will be able to uh, bring spotted lanternfly under control. But even if they get permission, which we've been trying to do this with brown marmory stink bug for almost 10 years and we still haven't gotten permission. Once they release it, it's still going to take a period of time for it to build up large enough numbers to have an impact. Um, there is one native that they have found that's um, in a few of the egg masses. It's actually a tiny wasp that they released a long time ago here in the east for the control of gypsy moth. And it seems to have um, a liking for uh, spotted lanternfly eggs. Um, but unfortunately, so far, it only is able to parasitize about 10% of the eggs in the egg masses where they find them. So it, it might take a while for it to have a, a larger impact. Okay, the next question. If we see many of the spotted lanternflies all congregating together, how do we get rid of them? Because we all probably can't dance and jump up and down for an extended period of time. Is there any right. mass treatment including of myself, extermination? Yeah, so if you look at the insecticides that I have listed actually on this slide, those are the things that we would recommend. So carbaryl is seven. Um, you can buy that over the counter and you can spray them just like you would a wasp um, in, in, your, you know, in your house, that kind of thing. Um, bifenthrin is a pyrethroid insecticide. Uh, you can also buy this over the counter as an insecticide spray. The one thing you need to do is to make sure that the plant or the, the plant type um, that you want to spray is on the label. Um, it's actually illegal to spray things that are not listed on the label. So if it's say you have a small maple tree that you can spray the whole thing, um, say with a spray can, it's a seedling or, or a very small tree. Um, if it says maple on the label or it says ornamental trees on the or ornamentals on the label it's legal to do that but if it didn't say that I wouldn't be able to do that legally um, these are both contact insecticides so they are designed to kill it immediately okay so the next question posts have been made on Facebook citing a danger to dogs from eating or stepping on the spot or lanternfly. Is this true? You know, what information is there? Right. Also, is there a danger to children who might, uh, you know, see this beautiful spotted red and gray thing and want to touch it? Okay, so this insect has sucking mouth parts. However, the sucking mouth parts are only good for sucking juices out of plant material. They are not designed to bite anybody, so they will not bite a pet, they will not bite a child. Um, we're not sure about whether, uh, say, a dog eats one, whether it will make it sick. Um, it's possible. Uh, we think that it, that's possible uh, because um, these things feed on tree of heaven as adults. And tree of heaven has a lot of na nasty chemicals in it that we think the um, insect sequesters in its body. And the coloration of it, the red is kind of a warning color in the insect world um, to other things that are toxic, don't eat me. So it's a possibility there. Um, young children uh, do have a tendency to put things in their mouth that might cause a problem, but I, I honestly can't tell you for 100% sure whether it's going to cause a problem or it won't cause a problem. I can definitely say there's, there's no uh, biting in, you know, issue here like there would be or sting like there would be with a wasp or a mosquito next question since we have them all around us right now is it is there any benefit to continue reporting them where they've already been logged by the department of agriculture good question and in fact the department of agriculture um, website says 
and I'm sure they've, they've modified it to, re, to reflect the expansion of the quarantine counties, that if you live in a county where this insect has been quarantined, there is no reason to report it anymore. If you live in a county not in the quarantine, or you can still do that, um, if anybody's on the phone and lives in Cape May or has a summer property in Cape May, if you see this, call the Department of Agriculture because there are wineries in Cape May County that would possibly be um, at risk if they if they show up there. Okay, another question. Um, this person manages commercial properties in New Brunswick, urban, no trees, but their building has been inundated with them. They seem to be attracted to black granite and metal. Um, other than these chemical treatments, do you have any recommendations? Obviously this slide is perfect timing for this right. question, but is. is there anything else? Uh, so they came from somewhere, okay? And so if you can identify somewhere where they could come from and i would go look for tree of heaven okay um taking away the plant material um would probably help next year's issue hopefully reducing it now that gets tricky because if, if the tree's not on your property then you know how do you handle that and i don't have a good answer for that um, there is tree of heaven in uh, New Brunswick. And in fact, the first um, infestation in New Brunswick was found right at the southbound platform for the train system. Um, there's tree of heaven there. And one of my grad students, he lives in Manhattan and commutes and he found it there on one of the trees uh, two years ago. So it's, it's there, you have to find where they're coming from. Now, the good news is these are not very good flyers. They're better jumpers and, and crawlers than they are flyers. Okay, uh, so some people say they have, you know, infestations on their property, and you had said that the PA Department of Agriculture had some sort of tree removal program. Are there any programs currently or in the works that would assist financially in taking down these trees? None that I know of, and our Department of Agriculture and the Pennsylvania Department of Ag Agriculture is... Uh, they're just cutting down the, the, the tree of heaven and treating. Um, our folks are doing it in, in the wooded areas. So that they're not going to homeowner properties and taking it down for them. Uh, this isn't like the um, Asian longhorn beetle or the emerald ash borer. They did do that for those two programs, but that's not part of this program. Okay, another question. You had mentioned a YouTube video on how to make those uh, circle traps. I didn't see the link. Could you send that to me and I can make it, sure that all participants read it? It's, in, it's embedded in, the way, in those two websites. Okay, okay. I will make note of that and be able to share that because that was one of the questions on, can you show us how to do that? Uh, let's see. Let's see if this guy, wait. I understand the tree of heaven is one of the favorites. Is the state looking overall at the elimination of trees? Are they actually an invasive, someone said, is that an invasive species of the plant as well? And then they just kind of go on about that too. So okay, so tree of heaven is definitely an invasive species. It's not native to the United States, although it's been here a very long time. Um, it is native, native to Asia. Uh, Department of Agriculture has also been working on trying to find a natural enemy uh, to kill tree of heaven. Um, they have found a fungus that seems, I think it's a fungus that works very well on killing tree of heaven, but they haven't gotten permission to uh, release it. So early on when this insect hit, people were hoping that this insect would kill all the tree of heaven. And unfortunately that hasn't happened. Another question, um, someone says they're assembling under the roof soffit. So I'm guessing it's probably coming from a tree. Can they treat their property directly or do they really need to find the source of what they are consuming? Uh, well, for long-term, it's going to be best to, to try and figure out where they're coming from. And if you don't want to cut down the tree, um, spray the tree uh, where they're coming from. Um, there are materials that you can you can spray on your house in, in the areas where they're they're an annoyance. 
But again, uh, you need to make sure that the labeling says that you can spray it on siding, that kind of thing. Another question. Well, it's more of a comment, and I think you might find this intriguing. Adults and instars jump only forward, open the Ziploc bag in front, and approach them from the back. What do you think? Worth a try. Yeah, that, I, I, yeah, I, I, I would be very interesting to see that. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of insects do that. Uh, grasshoppers do the same thing, and you're supposed to, uh, you know, approach them from behind. Um, the problem with that is that they can detect vibrations as you sneak up, if you sneak up quickly on them. Yeah, I don't know if this insect can do that, but I bet that they probably can. So um, you had mentioned about the wasp. So there really isn't any current species of something that is uh, going to necessarily help that's here already. So it's a, well, in terms of there, waiting, other than for the what they treated for the gypsy moths back in the 80s. Yeah, well, there are things that are eating them. Um, there, I get pictures of praying mantises that are eating the adults and spiders that they've gotten all stages of gotten caught in their uh, their webs the problem is that those are their generalist predators they will feed on anything they can get their hands on they don't target a specific species or group of related species and so for something to be really effective it's it's got to have a much narrower um, host range another question doesn't tree banding capture other non-target species? Oh, absolutely. And that's why I said that if you're going to do this, to put uh, chicken wire around the tree over that, over the, um, the sticky tape so that other things don't get on, on it, that's absolutely a problem. So then the follow-up question is, how far away should the chicken wire be away from the tape? What should the spacing be? Um, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know. Uh, my inclination would be to just wrap it around the tree you know, tight enough that it doesn't slide down. Um, I think that would give something like a lizard enough surface area to walk over it. Okay, so here we go, if I can say this. Glyphos, wait, glyphosate. Glyphosate, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, isn't that a carcinogen or is that incorrect? Is that the one that's in Roundup? Uh, that is the active ingredient in Roundup. And if you are like me, you may have been getting a lot of Roundup uh, emails in your spam folder. Um, there is a class action lawsuit against the company um, for that. Um, the scientific community um, is kind of 50 50 on whether this actually is causes cancer or not um so um that's yeah it's a it's a possibility uh someone who's a retailer said they used a detergent type spray what would that have been maybe and it supposedly doesn't hunt humans does such a thing exist or is this one of these do not use it because it is not on the list of recommendations that you made Okay, so the, there have been lots of reports about people making soap solutions and spraying them and that will kill them or, or you collect them and you put them into soapy water and they die. Um, that does work, okay, against insects. Insects have a wax layer um, that prevents them from desiccating. And so if you spray them with a soapy solution, it breaks down that wax layer and they will die. Um, there is a commercial product on the, on the market it's called Safer Soap. Um, you may have seen that in garden centers for spraying on house plants for things like mites and aphids. Um, it will kill them. Uh, so another tip, I have been using a shop vac with a 15 foot hose attached to a pole. I suck up 100 to 200 a day. <laughs> what do you do with them once you suck them up? I guess they're probably all ground up and you have to bag them as you had suggested. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Um, would there be a way to train birds or other 
species that already exist to be attracted to lanternflies? Is this the kind of thing that, you know, those who have been in the uh, labs where they are not allowed to leave could be looking into? I don't know if that would be possible, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually looked yet at what birds might actually might be feeding on them. There may be somebody out there doing that. I, they just haven't talked about it or published the information yet. Um, you know, he had mentioned about the praying mantises being seen. Someone apparently has a friend who gets videos of the praying mantis eating spotter lanternfly. That seems actually pretty, pretty neat. <laughs> um, so it, the yes. yeah. Um, so are there, um, so the insecticidal soaps you recommended was that one, was it safe, so, safer soap? Safer soap. Yeah, that's a commercial preparation. But you can make your own. Just make sure that you don't make um, a solution stronger than 1% solution. Uh, because if you get to the, the amount of soap in the spray, in the liquid too high, you run the risk of, now you probably won't have that on, on a, a mature tree, but on, on younger trees um, or on other plant material, the, the um, soap, if it's too high, can actually cause um, what we call phytotoxicity. It'll basically kill the plant. I we actually did that. We during, don't want to do that. That's the that's antithesis yeah. of what we're trying to do to remove these During, during my PhD, we were looking for an alternative to um, some miticides in for European red mite control and apples that um, they were becoming resistant to the materials. So we tried to make our own soap solutions and I killed mature apple trees. So I know you can do it. Oh, I got no. solution that's, amount too high. <laughs> that's the hard way of learning, right? It is, it is. Well, that's what a research orchard's for. Yeah, exactly. You're not doing it into one of the major crop Right. for like Washington State. Now, if you see here on the slide, I've also got two uh, natural products, neem oil. If you're familiar with that, that's um, as a directin that they will that will kill um, the um, lanternfly, as will Bulgaria bassiana. That's an entomopathogenic fungus. It's a fungus that is um, the way it lives is to is to um, kill insects and draw nutrients off those insects. These are both commercially available. Um, they are slower acting, especially the Bulgaria bassiana um, is then maybe the synthetic materials, but those are out there as well. Uh, where do you purchase the sticky tape that you've been mentioning? Uh, you probably are best off um, just Googling it. Sticky tape for insect control would probably bring it up. Oh, I, someone followed up about the shop vac. Put soapy water in the shop vac, suck it in, and you kill them all at once. Oh, okay. See, someone oh. figured it out. Yeah, they already have. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, home solution, mixture of distilled white vinegar, rubbing alcohol, Dawn, and water. Someone's been using that in, as a spray. That would be similar. That would be similar just to um, to just using soapy water. Mm -hmm. If you scrape the egg masses in the winter and don't collect them, will the cold kill the eggs, or do you have to bag them all up, double bag them, as you had suggested earlier? Uh, the, the, unless we get below zero degrees Celsius, um, the cold is not going to kill the eggs. Oh, so someone uh, visits a home in South Jersey, maybe in Cape May, I do not know, they did not disclose. How do you check your vehicle to make sure you're not bringing them in? Okay, um, basically look at all the flat surfaces. So you're gonna look at the sides of the car, um, you're gonna look at the underside of the car, wheel wells, anything that they could adhere to. Okay, so I think we are caught up with questions if you want to continue your presentation. Okay. So I talked about that management. Talk a little bit about risk here, and then we probably are going to run out of time. Uh, so what's at risk? Well, in the landscape, um, the feeding of the insect is what's causing the, the risk um, in terms of not actually what they're, they're 
removing from the plant material. Uh, it's what they're excreting once they feed. And so the spotted lanternfly is, is like an aphid. And if you're familiar with aphids, they um, secrete, secrete honeydew, which is a sugary substance. And they do that because they take in so much fluid to get what they need, um, but they take in so much, they can't use it all. And so they have to get rid of it. So that they, they excrete it. Well, the um, lanternfly does exactly the same thing. And so if you are under, uh, park a car under, underneath a tree where these are up in a tree and they are excreting honeydew um, that can get on the car in a brown or black uh, mold, it's called sooty mold. And you can see a picture of it up there on the grapes. And you can also see that black limb that that lanternfly is sitting on, that's black because of the sooty mold that has developed in the honeydew that they excrete. And so that's the biggest problem um, in the landscape um, arena. Um, I've talked about Christmas trees. That is a problem. Um, growers, Christmas tree growers, um, I actually am talking to them about another subject on Saturday and I, I'm gonna ask, but I'm, I'm sure that those in the quarantine are very concerned about this and they are probably spraying the trees um, in advance of selling them so, so that they can keep the lantern flies off and there won't be any egg masses on the trees. Um, feeding can also cause a, a blockage of phloem flow. That's the, the liquid that they, they feed on. And in soup, real high um, numbers, um, they can remove a whole lot of fluid from the plant enough to either outright kill it or make it more susceptible to things like winter injury and not survive until the springtime. And so that's where the agricultural component comes in. Um, it's, it's with wine grapes. And in Pennsylvania, um, in the high population areas, the adults, um, the, the juveniles move in and out and don't do a whole lot of damage to the vines, but the adults come in starting here, probably right now, um, in large numbers into the vineyards and they're removing a lot of fluid from those and, and drawing on the, res the reserves the plants have to make it through the winter time. And in Pennsylvania, that has actually resulted in um, death of the vines and um, complete loss of vineyard uh, over in Pennsylvania. And so we're very concerned about that here. That hasn't happened yet here, but it is a um, possibility. There's also concern um, in terms of them feeding on tree fruit. They um, do this in, um, I believe it's Korea, and they have actually gone to bagging fruit so that um, they can't um, feed on, well, bag, not bagging, netting, putting netting around the, um, the trees. Because this insect doesn't feed directly on the fruiting structure, so it's not really feeding on the grapes themselves. It only feeds on the Wise. <coughs> excuse me. And the same thing would be uh, the case for tree fruit um, if they start feeding on that. In the forest situation, um, they are a big reservoir, depending on the types of trees in the forested area, um, for them to lay eggs on and then hatch and then move into other areas. And so that's the risk here. And again, here's another picture. And you can see the black material on, on this tree limb and that is um, sooty mold. And you can find trees this year, this time of year, if you can't see them, look around the base of the tree. And if there's understory foliage that's shiny or that is turning black, um, that's an indication that they are in that tree. You just can't see them. They may be way up in the top of the tree. And in situations, and I'm, I'm seeing this out at the gardens, um, the populations are high enough and they're doing enough feeding that it actually um, looks like it's raining from all the um, honeydew that's being ex excreted. Uh, this is just another picture um, of an understory plant with the city mold on it. 
Here's a picture of one of the vineyards that were was outright killed. It's a springtime uh, picture, and this was from feeding by the adults um, in in the winter time, or uh, in the fall. And here you can see the droplets on the on the foliage. Okay. Um, very quickly, this is phenology in grapes and um, first or second instars are there early in the season. The um, fourth instars can be around the, in mid-July, but then they leave and then the adults start coming in in August. Um, you can also see here that they are feeding on Atlantis at different times. Um, that's tree of heaven. And they're feeding at black walnut at different times as well. So here at Rutgers, we've been working on, or I should say, um, the people over in the ecology evolution um, department have been working on a way to detect these insects before you actually can see them in the vineyard or in the area. And so this is really important um, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, but it uses DNA analysis to uh, find these things. And places like New Zealand are um, looking to develop these or ha pay, help people develop these because um, they say it would help them um, in, um, save a lot of money. Uh, if, if you don't know, New Zealand's probably at the top of the list for countries trying to keep things coming in uh, to the country. And so we need a tool. And so if you're familiar with terrestrial eDNA uh, work, um, this is, is the tool that probably um, is going to help us a great deal. And in fact, it, it, it has been used to do this. And so basically um, what they do is this was developed for looking for um, new species in, in say water or doing population counts um, in say streams or ponds. Um, so they didn't have to electroshock the stream and um, potentially harm the fish that are there. So they can collect water and they run it through a, 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 a filter system that collects DNA and then they do a DNA analysis to, to tell what species are, are there. And so this has been on TV and, and, and it, it's showing up in a lot of TV shows, including uh, Finding Bigfoot, if you, can, if you can believe that. And so this is Judy Lockwood's um, team, uh, grad students uh, and two postdocs. And basically what they do is they go to an area where either they have found honeydew or somebody has said they've seen honeydew on the foliage and they, and they, but they don't see any lanternflies. And so they've got a uh, sprayer with um, sterile water in it and they're spraying that material, that plant material, they're collecting that water that they'll then put through that filter system and um, then do a PCR test, um, very similar to what's done for COVID detection and then see what kind of DNA is there. And so this is just um, an example of how it's been used. Um, they developed this actually for brown marmorated stink bug. And so they've now moved it over to spotted lantern fly. And so it, as I said, was first um, detected here in New Jersey in 2018. Um, they found populations at some small uh, number of farms in Northern Jersey, and they used this to find them on two vineyards um, where the, the vineyardists didn't know they were even there. So it, it does work, and they're hoping to be able to do a lot more with it. Um, okay, we've kind of talked about all of this. We talked about physical control and egg scraping, and you can see pictures here, better pictures of what those egg masses look like. And so it's, again, it, it's very easy to confuse this for something else or something else for this. Um, here's those two parasitoids that I mentioned that have been brought back to the US um, for hopefully for release. 
Um, this is just a picture of praying mantis eating an adult, and this is an, a wheel bug eating an adult, and then the spider is eating probably a third instar. Um, this is just a slide about the, the um, gypsy moth parasitoid. So um, it was um, released years ago for gypsy moth control. Um, pesticides, um, we, um, I've talked about those. Um, with grape growers, they have a lot more materials they can use. And so I just threw this in there to show you that there are a lot of things that can be used. They're just not available to the public, to the general public. You have to have a license to be able to use um, some of the, most of these actually. Uh, but notice that carbamate is on there. And in terms of um, control, um, carbaryl uh, gives excellent control, as does the um, pyrethroid, the, I believe it's Mustang Max, um, is the um, bifenthrin. Um, so again, we, we do have botanic, the, um, this is the product with the uh, Bavaria bassiana um, in it. Again, it's a, it's a fungi and you can see what it does to the insect, um, but it is, you have to realize that it is slow acting. It, it isn't like the standard insecticides. Um, here's um, for adults. And in this case, you can see that carbaryl is also excellent in terms of as control are, as are some other things, but um, they are more resistant to a lot of these materials. So there's a lot more here where they uh, give poor control um, when they come in contact with it. And so here's my last slide. Um, basically, identify, learn how to identify the, the bug and then kill it if you can. Um, you won't kill them all, but every little bit helps. The good news is they only have one generation. So far, grapes and landscape ornamentals are at, at risk, and so we're concerned about that. And just to show you how well they um, are hitchhikers, um, this is an adult that got on the state vehicle that a colleague of mine in the department who works with this insect, she's actually involved with the group working with grapes, drove over to Pennsylvania, to Berks County to see the infestation and if she hadn't um, checked her vehicle like she was supposed to, she probably would have brought this insect home to New Jersey. So they are very good hitchhikers. And so with that, I'll unshare my screen. And if we have time, I can take a couple more questions if there are any. Yes, there are. So um, where are the egg masses normally found on the tree of heaven? Is there near the base? Are they higher up? Do they have a height preference? Um, on small trees, they're going to be within, I think I said three meters. Um, on large trees, they could be all the way from the base to the top of the tree. So you've mentioned the whole honeydew on the grape leaves. So is there kind of a standard look of leaf damage that we should be on the lookout for in any ornamentals near us? Uh, shiny surfaces on leaves um, that are not normally um, shiny. If you see that on the low plants, that means there's probably something up higher that's feeding and, and excreting. Um, and then the, the leaves um, take that dull blackish color. It looks like they've been covered. It's uh, hence the name sooty mold. Uh, do they also eat fig trees or roses? Um, I believe they can feed on roses because they do feed on other members of, of that plant family. Um, so roses and what was the other one? Figs. Figs. Um, I don't know of any reports that they feed on figs. Um, so there was one of the websites that you had in your presentation, the PSI website says, someone said they have recipes for safer soap and all that. Um, it was one of the recommendation page, I guess, where the, also, I guess, where the traps were. 
Do you happen to know what they mean by PSI website? I'm guessing something about Penn State Ag, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, it probably is. Cooperative Extension. Okay, so I'll look that up. Um, oh, just a neat detail. Honeybees have been bringing the tree, uh, 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 the tree of Heaven honeydew back to their hives to create honey, and the Philadelphia Bee Company is selling it as Doom Bloom Honey. And here it has an <laughs> oaky, woodsy taste, so now we can actually taste this threatening product. That doesn't surprise me, and there's probably other uh, ants and other things that may be doing exactly the same thing. So they're getting a, they're getting a benefit off. Yeah, it. they're getting a benefit. Um, someone said that they have two to three hundred of them in their backyard all summer. They put traps on four of their trees and killed over two hundred each day. They've been seeing that they've been so they're wondering if it does that mean the eggs were laid in different zones from those different times where you said like the different temperatures. Do you think that the traps got most of them since they captured so many at the beginning? Um, well, if you're in a high population area, yeah, you're gonna have to replace the trap. You're gonna have to empty the traps frequently because once they fill up, you, they're not gonna be effective. Um, I'm not sure how else to answer that question. Oh, this is interesting. This is a unique one. Would uh, using a power washer to hose down the trees be worthwhile or cause more harm or just be wasteful? Okay, well, that's an interesting question and it probably wouldn't be a bad thing to try. Um, I will say that, you know, at the gardens where I'm, I'm doing sampling, the week before Ida, we had very high populations and after we had much lower populations that haven't rebounded. And I'm wondering whether the, the heavy rain that we had had an impact on them. Yeah, that will be interesting to see. Um, could you make the slides available to people watching afterwards, Dr. Hamilton? Could you send me a PDF so people can- Yeah, um, if I can make a PDF and I'll be more than happy to send it to you so you can put it on the website. That's not a problem. If it doesn't show up tomorrow, just shoot me an email. And no, then... I know how busy you are. This is yeah. <laughs> this plus, you know, a regular academic schedule is a lot of things to do. Yeah, oh. but I'd be, I'd be more than happy to do that. Awesome. So another question: um, with those native regions where the spotter and lanternfly came from, where before it made the jump, did were there any known birds, or was it only wasps and other things that were um, that were seeming to be able to do damage to spotter and lanternflies? Um, well, they wouldn't have been looking for anything other than maybe a disease or another insect that, that feeds on them or kills them. They don't normally um, look for birds that feed on them. Uh, we uh, don't really um, advocate in biocontrol the use of um, vertebrates. Um, I could cite many examples. Um, the most famous or infamous one is the cane toad in Australia, if you're familiar with that. That was actually introduced as a biological control agent and it is now a huge problem. I just want to thank Dr. Hamilton uh, for a really interesting program. And as Melissa said earlier, this is going to also be available for viewing on the YouTube channel of the East Brunswick Public Library. And that'll be easy to find. I think it'll be posted by Wednesday. So that's great to know. And Dr. Hamilton, again, it was really wonderful to hear your uh, expertise. And thank you so much for uh, coming here and talking about this pest. And we really learned a lot from, from what you talked about. Kirsten, thank you for having me. And I'm glad to hear that everybody learned a lot. I did see a question that popped up. Um, <laughs> safer soap is not as effective as the, as the other synthetic materials like um, carborill and bifenthrin, but it's, it's, more, it's friendlier um, and it will kill them. It just is not as fast acting.